All right. So folks, welcome. Here we are. We're virtual again for September. We hope to be open in September, but circumstances aren't there yet. So we're going to continue our sequence here of uh, virtual open houses and uh, share what we're working on and some ideas and techniques. And, you know, as we go along, you'll see here on your screen, there is a place for Q&A. And so if you are wondering about something, you're watching this webinar and you have a question, feel free to type right in that uh, Q&A panel. And uh, several of us here are going to be watching that. We'll answer that question, hopefully, as we go through the program itself, or certainly at the end, we'll try to get to all of your questions. So again, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Um, and so here's where we're headed today. <clears throat> we do have a lot of new photos of our displays uh, that we will be sharing with you. So once again, every time you tune in, I think most of you have probably been on these uh, webinars before. We try to give you a fresh look of uh, some of the things we're working and uh, some of the displays from the past and a little bit of narration about what's happening in that display, what we're doing, some of the techniques. Uh, we do have a, a short video from uh, John Addison about how to pour convincing ponds and streams. He's using magic water there. So some really good techniques if you're doing that. Um, some of you in the past have seen that Dave was working on this uh, substantial German U-boat uh, sub-diorama, and so he's continuing to make progress. And he shot a, a video with the construction technique, specifically on uh, building some of the scaffolding. And so even if you're not building uh, a submarine diorama, there's a lot of really useful uh, information there on the construction techniques, and we'll be taking a look at that. The other thing is, we have a small feature here, how to model junk. You know, if you're going to be modeling a, uh, a scene, especially a model railroad scene, industrial, you know, there's going to be junk around. And so we know that, but, you know, junk is a model too. And we'll talk about the techniques we use to make it look like real junk. Uh, we have also have uh, delved into a brand new venture for us. It's quite interesting in 3D printing. Maybe some of you are doing 3D printing, not sure. Uh, or you're curious about it, certainly is a hot topic. So we're on a learning curve right now. We've uh, purchased our printer and the curing machine and our sonic cleaner. And so, uh, and we've done some initial printing. Uh, we're still, and so we'll show you what we've learned so far and a couple of things that we've printed. Um, then also, we're going to do as a short section at the end with tribute figures on the Sundance Central. Uh, one thing you find that if you've been doing this now, the Sundance Central is about 16 years since its inception. And so, along, if something's going to last that long, and you've got an older group of people, you're going to lose some members. So, we've done some tribute stuff with figures. You'll see that on the uh, Sundance Central layout. So that's where we're headed. So if you've been here to the center before, you know it looks a lot like this. If you've been to virtual open houses, this is a similar picture. For those of you that haven't been here, we show this to show you why we're not open right now for live open houses, because it would be really tough to do social distancing. Uh, we're thinking about November. Hopefully we can be open. We'll look at that. Uh, Charlie Belcher from Channel 13 is supposed to be here at least tentatively scheduled for a, a live broadcast in November. We probably won't be this crowd. We'll have to do something for crowd control. So we're gonna figure all that out as we go forward. But those of you who've been here before know that we have multiple displays. Uh, this is an operating display, our O-scale Lakeshore Industrial Railway. Um, and then you get a sense for looking down at least the right-hand side of the display area in the building. You see the main thing on the left part of the picture is the Sundance Central. Uh, 1 to 20.3, the centerpiece of the uh, of the center, but there are displays all the way through. In the back, you can see our modeler stage for the workshop where we do a lot of our workshops. And so this is another shot in that area. You can see that uh, you're interspersed here with military displays, other operating layouts. You can see the muskrat ramble there in the uh, the back. And then this is from the other side. If you're on the other side of the uh, the room, this is Charlie Belcher from Channel 13, but this is a view of the Sundance Central there in the, the center part of our display area in the museum. So you just get a sense for perspective if you haven't been here before or reminiscing a little bit if you have been here before. And you know, just a reminder, we do build things here. This is our back shop. This is the latest build that we did. This is the uh, early work we did on the Lakeshore Industrial Railway, which is our switching layout in O scale uh, where people can actually operate. So we did a lot of the construction, really all the construction on the layout itself. It's uh, three, uh, three modules that we have put together, three six-foot modules, and so we did the construction there. You can see another shot. We're working here in the back part of the shop and on the backdrop that we were developing. 
So a little bit now about some of our displays. Um, this one is one you may not have seen before. So Frank, if you can turn your microphone on, this is your, your coaling station here. Dave took this picture just the other day, but tell us a little bit about what's going on here, Frank, and some techniques. Well, it's uh, Dave gave me a model kit, and I don't remember who made it or whatever, but uh, I took the kit uh, pictures and uh, plans from the kit and uh, brought them up to 120.3, and uh, it's all scratch built, obviously, since they don't make kits in this scale. And it's a coaling station, and what happens is the coal comes in by gondola to the rear of the uh, building, and they shovel it inside, and it goes into these buckets, and then the buckets are hoisted up, and uh, the tender on the locomotive backs up to the coaling station, and they unload the bucket of coal into the tender, and it's just uh, refueled that way. And there's a scratch-built uh, steam shovel out front, and uh, he's cleaning up a little bit of a mess there, but uh, Dave did a really nice job on this photo. I gotta admit, it uh, really looks good. Makes yeah, it look so, kind of antique -y. Yeah, and well, we also, I know it was there when I was there when he shot it, we did some light on the front because where that's located, it's difficult to get light in the front of that building. So a lot of people don't see the details. Nice to see it in the photograph. Also, okay. you got some nice clouds in the background. <laughs> right. And so here, Dave, you may want to comment about this. Uh, this is a figure, this is animated. If you've been there before, this guy actually bangs his hammer there on the anvil. Um, and so I believe the mechanism was done by a guy in Australia, right, Dave? Yeah, we yes, he did a couple of uh, animations for it. This is actually based on a photo I got from a logging uh, book that I have. It's actually had a, this temporary tent set up at this uh, logging site, and it was just a big tarp over some sketchy uh, structure. And this is my interpretation of that particular thing. Yeah, so you painted the figure? Yeah, you painted the figure. I don't know if I, I think I painted it after it was built, after the animation was handled. Yeah, yep, so his arm goes up and down, he's swinging that hammer. So um, another one of our displays, you'll see that there. Um, this one, what's the story on this one now? Well, there are several wagons on the uh, Sundance Central, and I built this one as a uh, farmer's wagon, and Dave thought it'd be cool, and he took it and added the tarp and the strap downs, and uh, I embellished the, uh, it's a laser kit, but it's a kit that's supposed to be for background models, so there's not a lot of detail. So I did end up adding a lot more detail to the wagon, and it's a, a foreground figure. Well, so Dave, would you would you print the uh, canvas on there, the R. Schmidt Farms? That's actually, <laughs> I took some material. They sell this material uh, for inkjet printers. It's actually it's actually material on a backing that you can run through a inkjet printer. So I just found this. Uh, symbol on the internet, kind of downloaded it, added Richard, kind of, you can see it's R. Schmidt Farrier. So I just added all that detail and printed it out and it's literally on a piece of cloth and then just hung the piece of cloth, a couple of techniques we have for, you know, making it look natural. And just thought it would be an interesting one. The background, you can't see it in this photo, but the background for this is a guy back there shoeing an oxen is this, uh, did you print that on a laser printer or inkjet? Uh, it was done on an inkjet printer. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. All right. So here's our next shot. This is, this is Steam Dog. You know, who built this? Was this Brian? No, this was me. I built this one. Okay. Um, it was, uh, it, it was based, I'm not even sure what I based this one particular one on, but uh, it's a, obviously it's a, um, a skitter, logging skitter, with a boom that's been handled, and it has a boom that helps lower and raise logs for loading onto. In this particular case, it's a logging wagon that Richard built. Another wagon Richard built. So this is all scratch built. Yeah. So question on the, you know, you look at the all those rivets and so on on the boiler and around the edges of the gears. You know, to get that effect, was that dry brushing? Uh, there. Yeah, there's a lot of dry brushing and everything I do. 
except figures. Um, yeah, this was actually a brass model that I had from uh, Pacific Coast Models or something, PSC or something. I forget, large scale. Uh, great, they don't make them anymore. So they're like finding ones like Ken's do. But, and then it was just a matter of me weathering it. Okay. All right, so this is a shot, um, the, the engine house on the interior. You took the shot, right, Dave? I did take the shot. And the reason I took this is this, this is the kind of stuff that's rarely seen. I mean, it's there as detail, and if you spend enough time, you can go to the engine, inside the engine house, but it's so deep into the engine house, a lot of people miss it. So I thought it'd be a great photo to show you all the detail that we added to the uh, interior of the, of the layout of the uh, particular engine house. Yeah, you know, obviously we've all seen it for a lot of years, but you know, you don't see it from this perspective very often. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's good to have that shot. We have another interior shot here. You took this one as well, right? Uh, I did take this one and it's obviously one where the engine's coming into the engine house. It's just another angle, but I wanted to show you how much weathering and how many details are added to try to come up with a realistic Anybody's ever been in an old engine house, they get pretty uh, trashed up, for lack of a better way of putting it. So it's yep. a great spot. Okay. And this is outside the engine house, right? This is just a scene on the outside of the engine house. There's a boiler with a, dry, with a little drive motor that drives some of the equipment that's in the uh, 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 blacksmith machine shop area. Sorry, I'm in an area where I, my light climbs out. And um, this is just some of the detail, another shot that you probably don't pay much attention to when you uh, look at the layout. So when we look at the window frame off to the left there, we see we got some rotted wood there by the sill. How'd you do that? Uh, that was work. That, there are 40 separate parts in each one of those windows. Because um, I don't make them this way anymore. I do a different method with a laser and cutter. And things. This was all hand built. Okay. All right. So it's just layered up? All individual pieces that I laid a, made a template for and just added all the pieces together. Very tedious work. Took me about a year to build this engine house. Okay. Um, you know, one of the other things we try to do in our displays is, is uh, portray emotion. Now, this is the uh, Higgins landing craft. This is the Jeep that is inside of the landing craft. And so I took this shot is actually a close up of this guy who's about to be land on the beach. I don't know if it's Omaha beach or whatever beach you see, he's got rosary beads in his hand. This is a, a Luca figure, right, Dave? Yes, correct. It's a Luca figure. And uh, he, he, he's very good about giving the sense of emotion and movement in the figures that he does. So he hand carves the, the heads on these? He does a lot of it. He usually starts with maybe a basic one and then adds a lot of detail. And, you know, you can see all the teeth and things inside of him. He does all of that now. He's gotten, over the years that I've worked with him, he's gotten better and better at doing this. That's a great shot because it does, I mean, the rosary, people just don't see that stuff. Right. Now we can pan back here. You see he's still in the background, but this shot's a little bit wider. See lots of other things going on. Guy's pretty intent about getting ready to drive that Jeep off the landing craft. Sure, it wants to go fast. And, uh, you know, I don't know if that's Sarge or who it is is giving orders back there, but, you know, this is another part of that same picture, right? Yeah, and the thing about this is, is it's actually, that's a ranger uh, a figure, and he is an officer in the front of the Jeep. But this is actually, the figure in the back with the rosary beads is, is actually Navy, it's part of the shore party. So he would go back and the, the truck is full of radio. So what happens is they would get on shore and then radio back to direct gunfire and things to the Navy while they were on shore. So this, this depicts the Rangers and the, and the shore party going on shore uh, on D-Day. Okay. All right. By the way, we have other displays, other figures. Um, tell us a little bit about this one, Dave. This is well, a this is a figure. And this one is the, the entire figure is built. It, it all started out as a G.I. Joe figure that was completely resculpted, and everything you see in here, with the exception of the rifle, is all handmade by Luca. Uh, the horse was not, that was done by another gentleman, but 
all of the um, painting and, and configuring of the horse was all done by Luke. And it's just one of his, it's a fantastic piece of work. And it's, it's the Lakota warrior. All right, so this is one of the first things you see when you come into uh, the, the theater here at the center. One of the next things you might see would be this. I don't know if you've seen this photograph, Dave. I'm not sure if I, I think maybe you did this one. I'm not I sure. did, yeah. Yeah, I have not, I've, I've got other versions of this. This was a very difficult figure to, to, uh, to photograph, but yeah, it's, uh, it's my version of, with working, this is a, a collaboration. Um, the horse was made in Mexico. I did the diorama and, and Luca made the figure on top. And this is from the movie Open Range with Kevin Costner. If you look at his face, it looks pretty much like Kevin Costner. Yep. And so, um, you know, we have other displays. Probably, I don't know if anybody's noticed this before. <laughs> What's the story on this one? Well, this was a little whimsical. Uh, there's a gentleman in Spain, I can't remember his name offhand, that made this particular one. And of course, sci-fi is big in the world right now. We don't have any in the center. So I thought this would be a great addition. And it's just kind of a, an apocalyptic made up kind of thing, but he did a fantastic job on it. So it's a really good display and uh, pretty creative. Yeah, yeah, until I uh, did the photograph and started uh, you know, bringing it down with, you know, zooming in a little bit, you don't realize how much detail is in this thing. And these, these heads are also very realistic. Yeah, I mean, uh, like everything else at the center, if you start to dive deep, you'll, get, you'll see more. <laughs> yep, okay. Um, so let's move on to our next topic here. How to pour convincing ponds in streams. And so we've got about a three minute video segment here that John Addison put together. He was actually over at the uh, Suncoast Model Railroad Club in Pinellas Park and was pouring streams. But you know, this is a, a good and quick sort of uh, succinct way to, uh, we all have poured casting resins before with uh, varying degrees of success. But he's got some really good tips on there. So let's see what he has to say. Howdy folks, my name is John Addison. I'm a member of the Suncoast Center for Fine Scale Modeling. And today we're gonna to talk about how to pour a, uh, magic water. And this stuff is really great stuff. It never yellows, it stays consistently clear. And I'm gonna show you how to do it. As you see, we've got a canal here at the Suncoast Model Railroad Club. And there's an old junk car in there. And if you come down the canal here a little bit, you'll see some other stuff we've got right here. We've got a bunch of limbs and stuff like that in there. And then down here, we've got an old rowboat. And then down here, we've got a guy fishing in the water at one of the little dams we made. Okay, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go mix the magic water. I'm gonna use a digital scale, make sure I get the two to one ratio right. And I'm going to mix it vigorously for 10 minutes, and then we're going to come back and I'm going to pour it and show you how it's done. Okay, folks, I've got the resin all mixed. I spent 10 minutes stirring it vigorously, and now we're going to show you exactly how we pour the second pour in this canal. I'm going to start right over here, pull the stick out. Now, the stick is designed to show control where the resin goes. And now I'm going to start pouring the resin down here. I'm going to move it down as we go. And we've got to, you've got to, it's important to have everything glued down pretty good when you do this so that you don't have problems later on with things moving where you don't want them to be, of course. And we're going to go all the way down the canal. You're going to get down here by the bridge. Again, the stick will con help you control where the resin goes, and that's real important, just like so. All right, now I'm gonna come on the other side of the bridge. I'm gonna let the stick drip off a little bit here. And then all at once I'm gonna jump over here. And now I'm gonna pour on this side, okay? Just like that. And of course, just like water, it'll find its natural level. Now they'll probably end up being about four pours in this part right here. I can see that right now. And then we may come back with some crystal clear caulk and make the water look like it's moving and stuff like that. That's a great product to do. Now we're gonna come back down here and we're gonna go on this part. The same thing, I'm gonna be pouring it. 
just like so. Now always remember when you do this, do not, when you, when you run out of resin coming out of your cup, do not try to scrape the insides of the cup. That is a no-no because that resin is not properly mixed and it will not set up right if you do that. So that's important. Very important to do that. We'll put a little bit back here, back it up a little bit. And we get a little bit up in here. This will help make the, don't have much left here. I'm going to put a little bit here. Okay, and that will seek, just like water, seek the lowest point and level out there. The nice thing about this product also is it does not seem to have many bubbles in it, so you don't have to worry about getting the bubbles out. They seem to naturally come out. Okay, folks, that concludes our clinic. Okay, so there are some really helpful tips. Uh, by the way, this uh, video is available separately on our YouTube channel. So if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you can go back and watch this as many times as you want. Unfortunately, we don't have John live on this call for some additional commentary here this morning, but I do know in talking to John and doing some water myself, one other tip he shared, and I learned the hard way, honestly, on my HO switching layout here at my home. Uh, if you put natural material like twigs and you know, other ground up leaves or things of that nature down in the, those, uh, the beds um, in some of those streams and the, some of those ponds. Um, if you don't seal them before you do it, sometimes that'll bubble up and that'll cause your, uh, your casting resin to, to get giant bubbles over a period of time. But anyway, there's some good tips there on how to, to do that, how to use the product and how to keep those bubbles out. And you can watch this video anytime on our YouTube channel um, that you like, so it's available to you. Okay, now I mentioned that, you know, Dave is continuing to make progress on the German U-boat diorama, and so he's got this video he's going to be sharing, I'll be sharing with you here, uh, on the construction techniques that he used, and then we'll go to Dave live after that if uh, we have any questions. All right. Do the design. Now, I designed it because Start at the beginning. There we go. Hi, this is Dave with the Suncoast Center for Fine Scale Modeling. And today, we're going to be building details for the largest diorama I've ever built. So this is where it all began. This is the model for my Andrea miniatures that I used as my inspiration for the build that I'm currently working on. As you can see here, this is mine, and it has the basic elements done. The uh, dry dock is essentially built. The U-boat is essentially built. The large structures are done. There's even some details that, uh, like the uh, traveling crane and the uh, railroad cars and engine, they're completed, not fully detailed yet, and I'm working on those. But today we're gonna to concentrate on scaffolding. What you see here is the scaffolding that was provided or shown in the picture from the Andrea miniature one. I had to do some research to find some correct scaffolding and I couldn't find anything that looked like that. But I did find this picture. And this photo shows uh, wood scaffolding. And so I elected to try to use the wood scaffolding on mine as opposed to that steel scaffolding you saw on the other one. So you gotta look up close, there's a lot of these things. And my first step was to do the design. Now I designed it because I, on the computer, because I have the advantage of being able to use a laser engraver cutter to do a lot of the work. And, it, and mind you, there's about 18 or 19 different or individual scaffolding pieces here. So I had to do uh, mass produce these. So the first step I did was I took and cut some basswood, which is some softwood easily engravable and cuttable with no knots in it. I cut it on my bandsaw to the thickness of what I wanted the scaffolding. When that's complete, now the reason I use a, uh, a 
bandsaw is because it adds texture and it'll come that'll that'll be important later on when I show you the process. Uh, this is a close-up photo of the texture, actually the bandsaw marks that are in the wood. Um, when you're dry brushing, this is important. So the next step was to uh, load the program and then put the wood in the laser engraver and the laser engraver cut the parts out. You don't have to do it this way. You can use strip wood. I just was able to do it this way. Now I'm going to go over the tools and materials. First, the tools I used. Uh, sandpaper, sanding sticks, uh, small sanding sticks, uh, a sanding paddle kind of device. Uh, these are the various types and they're available at uh, mostly internet hobby shops at this point. I also use this needle, or lack of a better word, for uh, detailing and some cups to do some mixing. Uh, Blue tack is a, a product that I use to temporarily tack things down onto jigs. Um, you can use it for all kinds of things, but it works in this particular case for holding down the parts and pieces as we're gluing them together. So, and then of course, there's a, a little bit of a palette that I use. I line them with aluminum to, so that I can just throw it away when I'm done to do the dry brushing with. So now we're on to the materials that I'm going to use for this. And Oh, I'm, I'm incorrect. What it is, you, what you see here is the wood burning tool that comes into effect here. Once again, since I mass produce a lot of things, this tool actually saves me a lot of time and I'll be using it in a, a little bit further in the video. One more item is an airbrush. This is a, I use this mainly because I can evenly apply finishes washes, things of that nature. Rather than brush them on, I use an airbrush, but you don't have to use an airbrush for the, what we're going to show you here. Now, what I've got is um, the materials that I use. Uh, that's super glue, a uh, little bit of super glue. I can use super glue with lightweight things. I don't use it for heavyweight things, but lightweight things. These are um, um, acrylic paints that will be used for dry brushing, and these are um, oil paints that I used for making washes with and we'll show you that because when you're doing these models there are four elements involved and I'll go over those in a little bit. Now while I was doing the laser cutting I cut a template on a piece of waste pl uh, plywood. The uh, template is used to hold things down so I can make everything sort of consistent and from one item to another. So this is the material after I've taken it out of the laser. I put the blue tape on it so it would hold parts in place and then they wouldn't be, I wouldn't have a pile of just sticks. I could actually do a little organization as I put these things together. So I'm sorting through these now to uh, establish what's done for one uh, scaffold. And then they're done in sets so that I can do, I think I cut through do about 25 different pieces of scaffolding here. So after that's done, I lay the template down and then I take the blue tack that we were looking at earlier and I use that to hold down the parts. I kind of just work it in my hands, get it kind of soft, place it where I want to hold some stuff. It takes a little bit of working to do. You got to kind of warm it up and uh, put it on the template and then you'll see here that I'm going to add the parts onto the template after the blue tack is in place. And that'll hold them temporarily while I glue things up and making sure that my scaffolding is pretty much the same from one to the other. I don't want to make it too um, uniform because scaffolding is kind of just cobbled together and it's not fine woodworking, so I don't want to represent that either. The next step for me to now, the next step for me to is to sand these pieces. The downside to using a laser to cut your wood parts is that lasers burn, which leaves a burned surface, which doesn't look right when you're uh, trying to assemble something that's, uh, you know, like this scaffolding. It wouldn't have a burned surface on it, so you have to get rid of it. So I use the sanding sticks for this purpose. Now, I also use the standing sticks to actually kind of give the lumber a bit of a rounded over used look. So I go through this process of sanding and I've got to do it, it's a little bit tedious, I've got to do it for every piece that I put on there. 
And it's good to do it prior to assembly because if you do it after assembly, it's even harder to sand. So I do the I sand the pieces prior to assembly. Now with everything sanded, I lay the parts and pieces on the template, put them in place. You can see the blue tack's gonna hold them. And then I just move from one piece to the other and it's good enough to be able to do the assembly of the other uh, cross pieces. Now I take small amounts of super glue. Like I said, super glue can work in this circumstance because the pieces are really lightweight. Hold it down for a second, let the super glue grab, and then I'm off to the next piece. What you see me doing is putting accelerator on. That just makes the super glue dry faster. This is an aerosol type. To make a liquid type, this is an aerosol type. And it allows me to pull that off without having it fall apart. And then I'm on to making or adding the top piece to it. And I don't need, I've actually uh, engraved the um, glue spots onto the piece prior to, uh, or in the cutting process. So I know exactly where this part needs to go. More super glue. And then holding it in place till it sets. So I'm making another template at this point. And it, and it goes like that. Um, from uh, for every one of these that I do. So it's a little bit tedious, a little bit repetitive, but I took as many um, advantages of shortcuts that I possibly could by doing the laser cutting and the template making and having a bunch of uniform pieces. It just takes patience. The entire hobby takes patience. Glue up another one. And then after this process, you'll see that I do the assembly of the two parts, two separate parts together, and then add the other cross pieces. So I've assembled them, and then I use the other template to sort of set the angle, make sure I've got a, a, a the angle correct so that when I, it kind of works itself out because I cut the pieces based on the template, so it can only go together. If you put the assembly uh, pieces in order, it can only go together one way. More super glue. Hold the pieces together till it sets. More super glue. If you notice, the super glue has a very small tip on it or nozzle. It's a very small tube, which allows me to put the smallest amount. I don't use thin super glue. I use the sort of medium thick super glue so that it doesn't run all over the place. The thin glue super glue is used for certain things, but it, for assembly purposes, I use the thicker stuff. It allows me to um, a little bit of more working time before it soaks into the wood. It actually is more targeted. I uh, highly recommend uh, the medium super glue. So once again, I'm just putting the cross bracing on. accelerator to um, speed the process of drying and then I flip it and do the same thing on the other side same process so at this point you want to add some detail and what I like to do when you have something like scaffolding or wood pieces together sometimes we add what would replicate nail holes a couple of ways of doing this I'm using that long thin punch or needle to create what would be a nail hole now the downside to using this method is the fact that it's, uh, you gotta push on the whatever you've made and sometimes things you make in small uh, parts like this, it can create a lot of pressure and you can break things apart. You're literally are po poking a hole in. So as over the years, what I've learned to do is I've got a wood burning tool with a very sharp tip on it, similar to the tip that's on the uh, manual one. 
and I just burn what looks like a tiny little dot of of um, what would be representing a, a nail hole. And I just go from one to the other. It works very quickly. You don't have to use any pressure. It's just the tip using the using the heat of it to create what you're looking for here. Hey, you can see me applying nail holes with the with the uh, uh, wood burning tool. Okay, now that part is done and we move on to the sanding. I told you I did a little more sanding. What I'm trying to do is get off a little few more of the burn marks on the cross pieces. I'm also trying to round over the wood to make it look like it's been used for a while, not brand new. And the process, just, uh, just find the areas that you want to create the wear and tear in and just sand away. The sanding's now done. And we move on to putting a wood seal or sealer on this. Now, we're going to basically stain this wood. And what I'm trying to do is create a wash, not a filter. If I didn't seal it with something, and it really doesn't matter, you can use just about any kind of clear sealer. If I didn't seal it with something, what would happen when I made the wash is, is that it would soak into the wood and change the whole color of the wood, very dark. And I want this to look like lumber yard lumber, not, uh, you know, finished lumber. So by putting the sealer on there, what it does is it that keeps the wood from absorbing the stain that I've made from the uh, oil-based um, uh, artist colors. I used uh, mineral spirits and oil-based, and I just a very very thin wash. And what I'm trying to do now is create a a not a filter but a wash so that it collects in the low places and adds shadows uh, to the uh, object. After the stain has dried, then it's now dry brushing. Now I want to kind of bring up some of the highlights and that's what you use dry brushing for. Now I told you before I used rough wood. If this wood was smooth, sanded smooth, the brush when you go to dry brush would have less material to, to catch. So that when you went to dry brush it, if you're dry brushing something flat and, and uh, has no texture to it, there's no paint place for the paint to collect. By having a bit of texture to the wood, it would not only be kind of realistic because they didn't use finished lumber for a lot of these things, they use rough cut lumber. It also adds highlights and it brings up corners and, and just where the light would catch and it just makes things pop a little bit better. The nail holes begin to pop. So the dry brushing, and most people know what dry brushing is, you put paint on the brush, you take most of the paint off the brush, and then you take the excess and just lightly brush over the uh, model that you're trying to do. And it just leaves a very, very light line of paint causing highlights. I said earlier that most of the stuff, that there's four elements that we deal here, shadows and textures, um, in color, uh, shadows and highlights, colors and textures. I know I could get it right. So we were trying to do some highlighting just then. So there you have it, Wood Scaffolding 101. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you're interested in seeing more of what we do here at the Suncoast Center, please subscribe. And until next time, thank you very much. All right, so there you go. We had a couple of comments, uh, Dave, during the video one. People really like the idea of using the bandsaw and the texture that comes from that. It was a pretty nice uh, tip. You know, I have an observation as well. The uh, sanding off the burned edges there on the things that are cut on the laser. I mean, I've seen a lot of really nice layouts where people have laser cut buildings that they have built from kits. And they haven't sanded off those burn marks on the edges. and. A lot of times the paint just doesn't cover it. That was an important part. Any thoughts there? Yeah, um, 
it's just the downside of having to use a laser. But the upside is, is I can cut so many parts at one time and the accuracy is really good. But it is, it is definitely something you gotta think about. The other thing you gotta think about when you're using the laser is it cuts, it'll cut across the grain as with the grain. So you can have issues where the grain's not running in the correct direction. So you have to pay attention to that kind of stuff. Okay. All right, by the way, just an update. John, if you're, you're on the line there. If you can unmute yourself, uh, you might be able to. Uh... Hello, Jim and uh, everybody. All right, so here's John Addison. Uh, we did enjoy watching your magic water video. One of the things, the questions that came up in the uh, Q&A was, is there a maximum thickness when you pour that in layer by layer? What are your thoughts there? Well, I think uh, probably there's not necessarily a maximum, but I, I think really to be safe, you ought to not go more than a quarter inch at a time. Uh, that would probably be about the maximum to do it. You know, it, it will cure if you pour it thicker, but it's just best to do layers and be a little more patient when you do it. And then you'll come out with perfect results, which is what you want to have happen when you pour a resin. Because the product is expensive and you definitely want to have it, uh, you know, you don't want to waste, waste it. And you certainly want it to set up. So multiple thinner coats are better than one thick coat. Right, right. It you know, gets the, pretty hot when you pour it thick. And I noticed that you said you thought you were going to have four layers on that stream you were pouring. Did I remember that right? Yeah, since the video was made, I've done another layer and uh, I'm going to have to get some, some more magic water and do a, even another layer after that. So to, to make it where it'll flow over the dam and look natural and stuff like that. Okay. All right. Well, that's good. All right. So thank you, John. We're going to move on to our next topic here. And that's how to model junk. We know that Having convincing details in any layout is critically important, and junk is one of those convincing details. Uh, so, you know, Frank and, uh, and Dave, Richard, actually, John, you guys should all be live for this. I think you've all participated in these pictures we have here of developing this junk. This happens to be on the O-Scale Lakeshore Industrial Railway, Railway that we do, the, the switching layout in O-Scale. But you know, one of the things you see about junk, people put junk around, we know to do that, but you know, junk is a model. And when you do junk, you know, even though it's junk, it should have all of the weathering techniques that you would expect from your full, full piece models. And so you'll see in a lot of the stuff that we've done, we work pretty hard to use a lot of the same weathering techniques to make it look as though it would look in a real junkyard after being exposed to the elements for years. So Frank, I think uh, this is a scene that you did, right? On the, uh, the truck body and the cab and some of the other pieces here. Yeah, I took a bunch of uh, O-scale car models and uh, weathered them all up individually and then uh, brought them to the center and mounted them on the layout. And one of the things I did was I went online and I found a place where I could buy 100 tires. Uh, for, uh, it, was, it was pretty reasonable, actually. It was just a couple dollars to buy a hundred of these tires that come in different sizes. And uh, that kind of, you know, a junkyard isn't complete unless it's got a bunch of rubbish laying around. And one of the things is tires. So we've got tires all over the place. And uh, the locomotive in the back is a scratch-built locomotive. A scratch-built locomotive built from a Bachman uh, little uh, Two wheel or two axled, uh, I think it's a Whitcomb. And uh, we made, heavily modified the body to where it's almost scratch built. And then we have a small gondola there that's loaded up with junk. And we've got a, an electronic magnet that uh, picks up the junk from the gondola and puts it in the yard or vice versa, where they can load up the gondola and dump it into a barge that's being taken off to Lake Erie and uh, taken to Canada where we sell our junk uh, because everybody knows that it, uh, it's cheaper in Canada to buy the junk. So we've got, uh, this is, I don't know if you have any more pictures, Jim, but. We do. Uh, you know, here's another, this is another shot in that same area. You see the stuff in the foreground there. That's some stuff that, some junk that I built just to 
you know, putting that together, you got the flat sheets there and you got the corrugated stuff. Basically, I went to Lowe's and I bought a dryer vent, you know, the kind of you snake for an S, uh, basically, or that you're going to hook up your dryer and got out the tin snips and started cutting that stuff apart to get the metal scraps I was looking for. And again, you know, you can see on the flat sheets, you got a base coat there, you got chipping paint, you got a top coat, got some oils on top of that. So you, it took me a lot of time to build that junk. Junk could be very time consuming, uh, but you know, you got to make it look good. There's probably about six or seven different layers of stuff on there to, to get that particular look. Now, Dave, I'm going to, I think you have the answer. Maybe you do, Frank. You see the cement blocks behind the gondola. That's a question we get. Where do you find those cement blocks? Um, where do those come from? Well, we we'll cut them right here. The oh, way we did that was is we used a laser to cut a bunch of blocks. And I've got this material that they use in the floor shops. It's a green, mostly I've seen it. Oasis. Green. It's a green kind of foam. What do you call it, Frank? Oasis. Yeah. Well, Oasis. That's the material I used. And all I did was draw up a, a scale block and cut the material. It works great. Now, the problem with it is it's very... It's, it's a problem and it's a good part. It's very uh, fragile. So you can show crush block really easily, but if you don't want to show it, you can actually make some by accident. And then we just, I, I typically just soak it in something that firms it up, uh, like a white glue or just even, a, even a, 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 some uh, lacquer. doesn't really matter, but it, it, it firms it up a bit. And then you could dry brush it. Uh, you got to give it a color because it's green, so you have to you know, spray paint it or color it gray or whatever concrete color you're looking for. But it a makes couple, it a couple of other things about the scene here. You can see the junk laying around the tracks, which is typically what you see in a scene like this. Um, you know, the scraps of cardboard, you know, basically you'll see later some interior, you know, like stuff inside of a dumpster I did, but that was a Publix grocery bag that basically I tore up into small pieces. Uh, you know, to get that effect. And then you'll see on that junk pile in the lower right, you know, there's some uh, what looks like uh, plastic trash bags. Well, those are pieces of plastic trash bags that I tore into small pieces. You can stretch it out a little bit to make it look thinner. So you, what you do with a couple boards laying in there, so you do a scene like this, it needs to look pretty junky. I mean, not, not the junk itself, but that's what you see uh, in real life. Here's another example. This is... Um, I don't know, what, where did we get the interior, all this stuff? Was this stuff that you had, Dave, loose parts or something? I, th I think it's just a collection of models gone bad and left <laughs> over parts. So, yeah. I mean, it truly is just a collection of whatever is in the junk pile and whatever your little creative imagination can come up with. Right. I think it's junk. And it's got a couple of those sheets that I uh, had cut from the dryer event there in the foreground. And then this is the, uh, the barge. Uh, this yeah, again, but, spare parts or what? Yeah, this is a bunch of uh, what it, actually the mound underneath is just a piece of foam, so I couldn't have to have that many. And then it's just like I put some materials in there that were uh, old pieces of metal I had. Some you can see I, that there's some rolled up uh, chain link fencing in there. They, they, one of the things we like to do sometimes is the Coke machine with that color, sometimes it's good to have something have a little bit of color so that it breaks up and it kind of draws your eye to it. So the Coke machine was meant for that old Coke machine was meant for that purpose. Just right. creative junk. My guess is you faded that red paint down too as well. Yeah, it, it, there's, like you said earlier, this is building a model. It takes time to make it look plausible. So you have, it is, not very exciting, not very sexy, but it is modeling. Yeah. Um, Richard, this is your scene here just outside. On, this is back to 1 to 20.3 on the Sundance Central by uh, the Wilder, Welder Shack there. So um, how would you put this together, Rich? Well, basically, uh, it's a hodgepodge of stuff that's left over while they're working on actually a hand car shed. They're welding up some other stuff for it. And you have leftover drums that are empty and get damaged and dinged or they're rusted and they're just laying around. As you can see in the uh, foreground there, there's a hand car that's kind of 
gone to rust and everything else, no longer in use. And uh, just a pile of, there's rails, um, leftover uh, car wheels. So it's just a matter of combining all this stuff together and then adding some scenery, you know, that when that junk just lays around, you got grasses and weeds and stuff to start developing. So he put that in there to show that it's been some time when all this stuff was laying around. Yeah, that's a nice touch. I see you got a little bit of stuff going on the uh, bottom of the outhouse there too. Right. Yep. So, yeah, so good. Some additional techniques to bring that alive. John, if you're still alive there, this, this is over on the Silverton Central. Now we're in S scale. Um, hey, I'm here. Okay. So tell us about this scene. Uh, well, the um, uh, some of this junk here is actually made out of plaster. I actually cast it with uh, latex molds, and actually some of the stuff is out of plaster. Some of it, you know, is resin, plastic, whatever. But basically, it's done similar to what everyone else does. It's a uh, you you know you color it first. You make sure it has a good base coat on it so that it'll paint will adhere to it with if it's made out of plaster you don't have to worry about that but with metal white metal and other resins you have to make sure that it has some kind of sealant on it or something first before you try to color it and then you just basically build up the layers of color and you add uh, dry brushing to that and uh, stuff like that you know um, and eventually you know you add rust stains everything is kind of a watered based or, or oil based in many cases uh, wash that you put on it and uh, when you get it you know kind of like you want it then you kind of arrange it and uh, make it look like it's just been put here and there as people discarded the the various pieces of uh, you know the boilers and things like that were just kind of put in place arbitrarily here and there and lean you know up against there and I mean, you've got just kind of everything, and then you kind of put the weeds, glue everything down, and kind of put the dirt and the weeds around it to kind of make it look like it's been there for a while, because uh, that's important to make it look like it's it's it, it's been there for a period of time and stuff like that. And right. integrating it into the scenery. Yep. Re exactly. Yes. And you do have things in that draw your eye to do the thing. I think what Dave mentioned earlier, having a Coke machine that's red or something. It does really draw your eye to that barge, and it's important to have something in there like that that draws your eye to the scene. Right. All right. Here's another example. This is back over in the O scale layout. This is actually a 3D printed uh, dumpster that Dave got from Shapeways that I finished up. But the um, you can see inside, you know, what's junk. Again, that's the torn up grocery bags, you know, to make it look like cardboard boxes and pieces of cardboard boxes are in there and also some of the trash bag material. So you gotta have that stuff, you know, visible and you wanna have that line, you know, where stuff has gotten stuck near the top there where the lid comes down and that sort of thing. So it's putting that stuff and we borrowed some of Frank's tires that he made a reference to earlier. So it all helps the, uh, the scene to come alive. Okay, moving along, we mentioned that we are in a new venture now into 3D printing. And it certainly is interesting as we go forward, we're learning things every day. Um, and so basically what you see here, this is our 3D printer. It's one on the right there. The company is called Frozen. Um, and the distributor happens to be just around the corner from where we are in Odessa at the museum. But that's our printer that we bought, the Frozen printer. And then to the left of it is the machine that cures the, uh, the print when it comes out. And then to the left of that is an ultrasonic cleaner that we had that uh, we use to use alcohol to clean the pieces when they come out of the printer. So we have a, uh, a short video here. Uh, where is Venture 3D Printing? Um, you know what? I don't have the link. Oh, it's coming up. All right, so one of the things to know on 3D printing, 3D printing Everybody says, wow, you got a 3D printer. Can you print these for me? And you, could you print that for me? And the answer is technically yes. <laughs> but as you know, the real work or a big part of the work is getting the file to print. 
So Dave, you've been uh, throwing yourself into the world of PST files. Tell us a little bit about what we're looking at here. Well, I was able to find somebody, I mean, 3D printing is two elements, design and the printing. Turns out the printing part is the easy part. The design part is the more difficult part. So I've been able to work with a couple of 3D designers to that provide files. And we've, I've, I've got this one guy who uh, developed these figures and we've got 19 of them now uh, in these different poses. And these are two of those figures that uh, he sent me the 3D files on. And currently, if you see behind me, I'm currently printing three of these figures on the printer behind us. So um, that's how that comes about. It's trying to get them in the correct scale, the correct detail, the correct poses. Those are all more challenging than the actual printing itself. Right. So, you know, the, and there are people, there are plenty of people that you can get on these uh, gig sites that design stuff. You can send them a photograph or picture what you're looking for and they can do a PST file. We've done some of that. That's an interesting adventure as well. Uh, but having a good file to begin with is the key. So basically, here's about a three minute documentary. Just shot it informally. Uh, last week, we were up there at the center making one of our prints and you can see a little bit about how the mechanics work. See how the TL stuff? Yeah. So TL 50 LV, which is what we got. what it looks like. Hmm. Now it's bath time? Bath time. All right, so the computer software put all those supports in. It, 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 yeah, and me too. Okay, you chose? Yeah, I chose. I, I, I went through it, let, let it put some on, and I did the rest. All right, so is he ready to go in the curing machine then? Yes. Not the curing machine. He's ready to go into this machine. Oh. All right, so we put them in the ultrasonic cleaner. Yeah. How long is he gonna stay in there? I don't know, a few minutes. Put him in, I guess. Oh, it's putting him on, not one heating. Goes in the crock pot. All right, so. Okay, now what I'm gonna do, because we're gonna print another one, I'm just gonna clean this plate up real quick. Put another one in. Oh, so just by wiping that down, we're ready to print again. Uh, it did. Um, took two hours and 30 minutes. Push that. Uh, I'm not sure if it did it on the software, but did it on this. I've got to double check. Oh, okay. No biggie, I was just curious. So, it said, I only filled it up to about halfway. There should be enough resin to do another one. Yeah, because you didn't use it that much for that. Yeah, well, you see the line I drew? Yeah. Oh, you drew a line on it. Yeah. Pencil? So So I think you might screw oh, up okay. the, the features of it. It comes in different colors, though. All right, so let me go get my notebook.
Okay, so there, you see some, literally very informally, some of the mechanics of doing 3D printing. Um, a couple of things we can share with you. Well, that's what it looks like, by the way, when it's nearly printed. Now, Dave, I think you're live here. The, um, obviously, it's the ultraviolet light that has to be shielded when this thing is printing, right? Yeah. Um, when you print it, it's done in a vat of liquid. As it's, as, it's, uh, as it's being formed, this light goes. It, it passes light and, and cures it in layers. But it's not totally cured in the process. So after you remove it from the printer, you give it a bath and wash off all the excess uh, liquid. And then you stick it in a UV uh, chamber like this to harden it. Otherwise, yeah, so if you if you didn't have those supports in place, that figure would just like curl over because it's still soft. Yeah, the supports hold it in place until it cures. And then you just cut the supports off. And if you do it correctly, you put the supports in areas that are not going to be seen or are easily or you've designed a very lightweight support that leaves no mark when it's done. Right. All right. So um, here, by the way, is a figure we printed, right? And you cut all the supports off except for under his feet? Yes, that is the first print. That's the first one we, we uh, printed. Um, and it's not perfect. We had a little problem with his chin, but it was a pretty good print. And I've changed the file since then. So when we go to print it again, I, I, I hope I support it a little better. But okay. it came out pretty good. And you can see there are no lines. There are, it's a very good paint. Uh, painting, you can go straight from this to priming to painting, and it, uh, it cleans up pretty. Pretty nicely. Is this a 1 to 20.3 figure? This is one of the large scale 120.3. So he's about, I don't know, three and a half inches tall. Yeah. He's bending over, so it might be a little shorter than that. But how about that? So, so here he is painted, right? Yes, I took some time and, and uh, rip, now they're not completely finished because they're still shining here. And I've since dulled them down. But uh, Richard had a figure he wanted painted for some project of his. And since the two figures are never going to be shown together and I could get a good comparison, I just painted them exactly the same color scheme. So you can see the figure, which is a resin casted figure commercially available that Richard has um, had provided versus the one that we printed. And you can see the quality is pretty close. There's pros and cons to both, but they're pretty close in the, in the end uh, about the amount of detail and how well they paint up. And for those of you that don't know, we used to sell a line of figures in 1 to 20.3 that we uh, essentially had each one made by a sculptor. And then from there, we made a mold. And then we would have the figures cast. And we sold those on eBay for a lot of years. And there was still good demand, but we basically got tired of casting all those figures. It was a difficult thing to do. And the molds would wear out pretty frequently. And so it's, it was difficult. So that's part of our motivation is to, with the 3D printer is maybe we can bring the line of figures back and you can also do them in different scales because you're now uh, working with a computer that can scale them down to, to other scales other than one to 20.3, right? And so, the, um, so these are the two figures, by the way, the one that was, this is Richard's figure painted. <laughs> Dave just sent this picture this morning sitting on the uh, piece of power equipment over there. Uh, but, you know, it makes for a pretty convincing part of the scene. Were you going to use this figure, Rich? Uh, he may be I'm working here. on a uh, Bachman Shea to uh, give to Gwen's cousin. And uh, I just happened to have this figure and I thought it'd be nice sitting on the, uh, on the shea on the, one of the sideboards. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's interesting, this whole thing in the 3d printing, it's not inexpensive. That's for sure. Um, I think that our printer, uh, and our first gallon of resin and the curing machine was about 3,500 bucks that we spent all total on that. Um, and so we're still learning. Uh, we bought some pretty high quality resin, which is about $400 for what is pretty close to a gallon. It's measured in liters. Um, and we were trying to figure out, and the machine gives us some calculation, 
as to what the materials cost is uh, when you print a figure. I think that we had figured, Dave, didn't we figure that on the guy on the right that we printed, that was what, about $3.50 worth of resin? Is that about right? No, I think we're less than that. I think we're closer to mo probably more like $2. Um, the other thing I want to add, though, is that we bought a printer because we intend to offer these to the public again, and we're going to print them up. And, and, but you can actually buy a 4K from this same frozen company, a smaller printer, which a much smaller footprint, not robust like ours is, for about $300. Really? So again, it's not, a, but you can't print large prints. It's very limited on how size, the size of prints you can make, but you can, the prices are dropping like a rock with this stuff. And it's a 4K printer for $300. So in the 4K piece is just how good the resolution is, because you can look at this figure and you can't see any lines of print on this thing. It comes out pretty clean and that's what you get with 4K. The reviews I've heard on the $300 one are fantastic. And the yeah, reviews I've heard on this one are fantastic too. The same degree of detail, just smaller and less volume. Right. You just can't, you have, you're limited on the size of what you can print. Yeah. Yeah, so 3D printing is coming around. We also wanted this just to make some of our own parts for models that simply were not available. Um, so, you know, the laser has been extremely valuable to us, obviously, in making these models. And we're hoping that we get there, too, with the uh, 3D printer. But stay tuned. We'll keep you posted on our progress as we go forward. All right, one more thing, and we'll wrap up here in just a moment. Um, I mentioned tribute figures. You know, the Sundance Central really had its genesis in 2004. Here it is, 2020. And so over that time, we've had some very good friends and, uh, and great modelers that have been part, that have, uh, part of the group and passed away, but we've memorialized them. One is Brian Nolan. And uh, Brian's a well-known modeler, and, um, and he was uh, winning national awards and doing plenty of clinics all over the country. And he and Dave and John go, uh, go way back. And unfortunately, he passed away, what, about three or four years ago, Dave? Well, it's longer um, than that now. Yeah, oh, at, at a relatively young age, had a heart attack. Yeah, it was uh, early 50s, so. Yeah, and so one of the things we did is that we, we had the uh, sculptor send pictures and had a sculptor, you know, make a replica of Brian Nolan. And so he lives on the back of uh, this particular caboose. That's where we have them mounted right now. And so that's the original figure. And then, uh, and then Dave painted it. Um, by the way, one of the things you should know is probably next month we're going to do some things on figure painting. Dave's pretty accomplished in that area. He's got a video on that, or we're going to show parts of that video and talk about how to get this kind of look when you're painting figures. But Brian is still alive and well on the Sundance Central. That's a nice tribute for him. Uh, there's going to be an article coming up in the Narrow Gauge Gazette, right, about Brian and Sundance Central and some of his work that's happening in the next several months. Well, it's been submitted. We'll see. Uh... I think it's going to be. I'm not sure about timing or anything, but should be. Hopefully. Yep. And then Dale McEwen was one of the founding members back in, in 2004. Um, you know, and Dale did a lot of things. He uh, was you know, put in our smoke system, which hasn't really operated since he's been gone, unfortunately. Uh, he did a lot of things making prairie grass and the scenery and so on. But he's also our big time photographer. So we wanted to make a tribute figure of Dale. And uh, so it seemed appropriate since we're going back into the 1930s, late 30s, early 40s, to have a camera from that era. And so we had a sculptor make this particular figure. And so Dale is, um, he's there in the, uh, let's see, the shanty area at uh, the temporary camp, right? That's where he's on that, uh, that particular yeah. walkway. His logging camp, yes. Yeah. So Dale is still with us and will be tribute, tribute to him on the uh, Sundance Central. And then uh, lastly, Les Legault, John, you knew Les the best, right? There he is uh, next to your Silverton Central. And, yeah, Les, uh, for those of you that don't know, Les loved the center. Like, I mean, he used to look forward to coming up to the center. He couldn't wait to get there. He hated to leave when he had to leave, and, and he just uh, he just loved loved you guys and the stuff you did, and admired all of you. And he was just uh, you know, and he was great help to me with the Silverton, you know, setting it up and 
and uh, he just loved everything that we were doing. And uh, he was very enthusiastic. He reworked some of the trees on the on the Sundance, as you guys probably remember. He took some of those trees and reworked them and made them a lot better than they were. Some of the deciduous trees, especially. So he was he was a real enthusiast and. Uh, he unfortunately died of a sudden heart attack also. So. So you can see with Les's figure, because he's cast there again in the camp and these, um, we wanted a period, we did add the pipe. I remember seeing Les with a pipe, but we added the pipe there just for context for that particular character. So the, uh, it's a club that none of us are anxious to get in, but it's nice to know that, you know, we all think about this as we get older. What's our legacy? We want to try to make sure that Folks that are long, long, no longer with us and part of the group have a legacy going forward. So I, I think we've answered all of the questions that have come up in the Q&A pane out there. So I think we're clear on the questions. Just a reminder, if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, you ought to do that. All of these videos that we show here, you can go back and watch at any time, including you can watch this again if you want. There's a part of it you want to see. I'll post a recording of this in the next several days up there. So it's the Suncoast Center for Fine Scale Modeling. You can subscribe there, give us a like, and you know, share with your friends. And that little uh, bell button, if you, uh, you click that, that'll let you know whenever we post something new. So you can see it as soon as we give it, as soon as we put it up there. So we're gonna continue to feed the channel. Um, and then you know, our website, finescalemodeling.org, probably most of you are on the mailing list. It's how you found out about this virtual open house. But if you're not, you can sign up there directions because someday you'll come back and visit us in, in person and then our online gift shop is there as well. So uh, on that note, I think that we are wrapped up for today. It was great to have all of you here. Uh, tell all of your friends about uh, what we're doing here and uh, send them to our YouTube channel. I'll also post the link to our YouTube channel right as a header on uh, our website so you can, they can uh, pick up and watch anytime they want. So thanks for joining us. Continue to enjoy your modeling, and we'll be back next month. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.